2 Corinthians chapter 9, New King James Version. Paul is continuing his uh, thoughts on giving money uh, to help needy saints. And this, I believe, was essentially a like a more like a one time offering. Now certainly they would could have done it multiple times, but I believe that it was something that was discussed uh for a specific need for a specific group of people. Uh but I guess something that would go against that is is how long we see uh it's been a year I guess since they made this promise. So I guess it wasn't such an urgent need or they wouldn't have uh waited this long to to compile the gift and give it to him anyway let's get into this the discussion now concerning the ministering to the saints it is superfluous for me to write to you for i know your willingness but about which i boast of you to the macedonians that achaia was ready a year ago and your zeal has stirred up the majority so achaia or greece or corinth it's all the same thing uh were freely willing, I guess a year ago, maybe when Paul went through there, or Paul talked to him at one point describing the needs of saints, I believe, in Jerusalem. Uh, they said, oh, well, we could just take up some money and we could collect some money and send it to them to help them. Paul says, that's great. That would be a great show of faith and a great show of love for your brethren. That would be absolutely wonderful. And I'll go around telling other people about your generosity and your uh, freely, uh, I guess your your desire to help others that will be so beneficial for others to see your concern for the needs of saints in another place. And so a year goes by after that initial discussion about their desire to help financially, uh, and they have not even given the gift yet. So, and I don't know, maybe they'd taken up some money, but uh, I don't know if they pledged a certain amount uh, but <clears throat> they said they would give something a generous gift but yet they hadn't done it in a year because I guess nobody had come by and picked it up or and you know Paul hadn't come by and picked it up and carried it to the intended recipients which I believe were the Jerusalem Jew, uh, not Jews but Christians <clears throat> yet I have sent the brethren lest our boasting of you should be in vain in this respect, that, as I said, you may be ready, lest if some Macedonians come with me and find you unprepared, we, not to mention you, should be ashamed of this confident boasting. So Paul has been boasting, saying, man, the Corinthians were uh, want to take up money and help people in need, help Christians in need in Jerusalem. Uh, and it stirred up the majority of Christians all around the world uh, so that they would do the same thing. They would follow their example. Uh, but he says, we're about to come by. I'm going to send some people ahead to, to help make sure you're prepared because when we come, we want to make sure that you're a good example uh, to the Macedonians who will be coming with us because we've been bragging about how generous that you were and we, if we come and find out otherwise, then it's going to be, we'll be embarrassed and you should be too. Therefore, I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren to go to you ahead of time and prepare your generous gift beforehand, which you had previously promised, that it may be ready as a matter of generosity and not as a grudging obligation. <clears throat> so Paul is not uh, requiring them to give the gift. It was a matter of their own personal uh, desires, their own personal recognition of a need <clears throat> that they could, um, you know, that they could meet. And the same should be true today of taking up money or collections in churches. It should uh, not be viewed as an obligation. You know, a lot of times I hear people when they take up money in church, they'll say, for our visitors, we want you to know that you're not obligated uh, to give. Uh, but they expect their members to give because they depend on uh, they have a certain operating budget, and they expect their members to meet that op uh, operation, the operation cost. <clears throat> there should be no overhead 
to church. There should be no uh, operating cost, really. There's no need for it. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will, will also reap bountifully. So this is something that you could uh, lay on somebody as a guilt trip to kind of say, well, it's not an obligation. I'm not going God doesn't say you have to give money, but God does say if you sow sparingly, you will reap sparingly, and if you sow bountifully, you will reap bountifully. So I don't think this should be used as a guilt trip or a roundabout way of obligating you to do something. Uh, this is like reverse psychology, I guess, child psychology. Uh, we say, oh, well, you, this candy tastes horrible. <laughs> and then say, no, no, well, trying to convince the kid not to, not to eat the candy or something. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Giver. So you got. It's important that you have the right attitude. It's important that you give for the purpose of helping people out, uh, helping people in need. It's a. It should be uh, for the purpose of showing love, relieving people's burdens, not paying their salaries and and paying for huge expensive operating cost and overhead cost and, uh, of the church building. That's really not what this was at all. If you agree to, uh, to pay for operating costs and church salaries, then I guess that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that if, if that's what you want to pay for. But that's not what this is talking about. So if someone is using this scripture to talk about, oh, you should give every... Sunday at church uh, because the Bible says this stuff in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 about sowing and reaping and being a cheerful giver. Well, it's really talking about showing love for brethren, meeting their needs, because whenever you meet someone's needs, then that results in praise to God. It results in uh strengthening faith because people feel actually feel that God has rescued them or saved them from a, a difficult situation now some someone would say well hey if you uh, if you give money and pay for preachers and and church buildings that results in praise to God too because it gives play, people a place to go so that they can all sing and praise together and that's fine if that's the way you want to see it uh, I, I don't have a I can at least accept your perspective on it uh, for yourself, but that's not my perspective. Uh, I don't believe uh, preachers should be paid full salaries and insurance and vacation days and stuff for what they do. And church buildings consume tons of money uh, that I think should be better used for actually helping people in need and meeting their needs. That's just my perspective. Uh, I'm not saying it's wrong. Uh, I think it can be wrong. You know, if you don't have anything can be wrong. If you don't have the right attitude, uh, it, any, either way it can be wrong. But <clears throat> it's just, a, you know, my perspective and my what I think is important and what this con, what this chapter is even talking about. It's talking about meeting needs of saints. It's not talking about paying preachers or operating costs of buildings. Uh, and God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. As it is written, he has dispersed abroad, he has given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. So, you know, in the last chapter, in chapter 8, it talked about equality among the members that those who have a lot should help those who have little so that there would be equality and to me i see this is the same he has dispersed abroad you know those with the uh with more wealth and the ability uh to give and help those who have less there should be more equality in the church uh, even on a financial standpoint uh there it should be more balanced. 
than having rich people and poor people. You should have a, a better balance. It should be dispersed. If you actually love one another, if you actually want to be generous uh, and help a brother, then uh, there should be a way within the church to equalize or at least more balance uh, the, the big difference between rich people and poor people, even in the same church. But he says he also give to the poor. And his righteousness endures forever. So that's the idea here. It's giving to the poor. It's creating more equality in the church. Not so that this poor people have to come and, and see how the rich people live. And the rich people ignore the poor people. <clears throat> now may he who supplies seed to the sower. That's God. God is the one who supplies seed. We are the sowers. And God supplies us with the seed. So we couldn't sow if it wasn't for God. Uh, and he provides bread for food. May God supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. While you are enriched in everything for all liberality, which causes thanksgiving through us to God. So whenever you give to the poor, whenever you meet a need, that results in thanksgiving uh, to God. People... Thank God when other people help meet their needs because they recognize that God is the one who gives the seed so that the sower can even sow it. For the administration of this service not only supplies the needs of the saints, verse 12 is, I think, critical for understanding this chapter. The, the purpose for this gift was supplying the needs of the saints but also is abounding through many thanksgivings to God. So that's the twofold purpose of this generous financial gift is to supply the needs of the saints and to result in the abounding thanksgiving to God. While through the proof of this ministry, which is helping the poor and meeting their needs, they glorify God for the obedience of your confession to the gospel of Christ and for your liberal sharing with them and all men and by their prayer for you, who long for you because of the exceeding grace of God in you. So this, the exceeding grace of God in you is, I guess, generally would just be love for your brother, uh, appreciating your brother. But you could, if you love them but see they have needs and you don't meet their needs, if you're able to meet their needs, then you actually don't love them. But love is a grace of God. If people love one another, if they meet the needs of another, then that means God has put that grace in their hearts. That God is the source of that love. That God, so he is the supplier of the seed. So you cannot, no human can help another human uh, if God doesn't supply the seed to the sower. You have to recognize the source of the blessings, where it comes from, uh, and you can't pat yourself on the back and say, oh, well, I helped uh, these people. I met their needs. You didn't do it. God did it through you. God's the one that deserves the praise for it, not you. So a lot of times when people give in, in church, and they give, let's say they're wealthy and they give a lot of money, um, they feel like they're the ones that have given that. Well, I guess the danger, I can't speak for their heart because I don't know their heart. Uh, but the danger is that they feel like they are the ones that made the decision to give money and that they even feel like they should have uh, a lot of say-so and where the money goes and what's done with it uh, because they're the one responsible for giving. They ought to recognize that God is the one that gave them the money to start with, gave them their wealth, uh, and... If you're not giving with the proper attitude, with the desire to help other people, uh, the desire to meet the needs of other Christians, uh, if you've got some other attitude about, you know, being puffed up with pride because you give a lot of money, then you're not recognizing God for what God has done for you, and you're giving with the wrong purpose, um, and... You could be held accountable for those 
sins and sinful thoughts. So, I guess... Oh, I didn't finish. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. All right. <clears throat> I guess we'll end it right there. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Please like and subscribe and put your comments down below.